So last time we left off talking about how how DNA is uh, copied, right? Remember the big idea is that you have an original molecule, it's double stranded. The molecule has to be unzipped, and then each strand is used to build a new strand through a process that's pretty simple. Basically, if you look, the old strand is simply red, and the complement is inserted. So if you read uh, the letter T, you put in the A, if you read C, you put in the G. So the idea is really simple with replication, right? Take your original molecule, you open it up, and then each strand is used to build a complement, and then you will, what you end up with is two strands that are exactly uh, identical, okay? Now today what we'll do is we'll talk about some of the more complicated things in replication, all right? So there you go. Now you have two strands of uh, DNA that are identical. By the way, when do you want to do this? When do you want to copy DNA? You learned about this in grade probably 9 or 10. It's a process you learned about. So it's an M. Think M and M. Yeah, mitosis and, and meiosis, okay? So remember mitosis and meiosis. So when a cell divides, when a cell divides, it wants to copy its DNA. This is when that happens, okay? So when, during cell division, uh, DNA gets copied, okay? So, we left off looking at, so here's that, that idea, here's the, uh, so here's the strand that's being read. So you can see the strand here was T, put in A, here's a C, put in a G. So what letter would come here then? G, okay? Pretty straightforward idea. These are the enzymes involved. I think we left off talking about uh, maybe one of them. We haven't really gone into the names of the enzymes so much. Okay, so we're going to talk about that today. We talked about that to begin the process, the DNA has to open up. So this is a replication bubble, okay? Um, so you can see that the DNA is open. This bubble is that open DNA. This is a fork. This is a fork. And you can see another fork over here. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail about how uh, this actually happens. Here you can actually see the DNA strand being ripped apart. It gets actually ripped apart by this thing. This is an enzyme called helicase. Uh, what's the name given to the shape of DNA? It's known as a helix, something that spirals. So the, the enzyme helicase, which is this one right over here, helicase, this is the enzyme that actually which is here, you can see. Remember we study proteins, right? So here's a nice beautiful uh, image of what DNA polymerase, sorry, uh, helicase looks like. This is the enzyme that actually opens up uh, the DNA strand, okay? So when DNA is opening up, this is what it looks like. Um, you see this in dark blue, that's the new strand. So as the DNA continues to open up, the new strand is being read. And being built, sorry, the new strand is being built. The old strand is being read. Okay, the old strand gets read, the new strand gets built. And eventually, you get two identical uh, molecules. Okay. Now, we're going to go into a little bit more detail because you saw in the animation, there was a few uh, quirky things that were uh, going on. One thing you may have noticed in the animation is the presence of this red stuff. Do you remember what that red stuff is? It's that red stuff. Well, take, there's a big hint in the animation as to what it is. Children? It's RNA. Okay. And how do you know it's RNA? Because you see the letter U. So there's a couple of things that, even though replication is pretty straightforward, there's a few things that we have to talk about. One is, why do we need this? 
why is there RNA in this process? Because you can see in the animation that the RNA um, eventually just gets removed, right? So why do we need it if we're just going to remove it? What's the point of that? So the other thing that you notice is the way the strand actually gets copied, that you notice that this fork is opening this way to the left, and this strand is being built to the left, but this bottom strand over here is actually being built in the opposite direction. So we got two little mysteries that we want to talk about. One is, why do we need the RNA? And secondly, why is one strand being copied the opposite way? Okay, what's going on there? So that's what we're going to talk about. So you can see here, here's that, here is uh, that DNA strand here, so you, that helix shape. Here it's open up, so there's that bubble, okay? There is that RNA. Now here it's like an orange color. You can see it here and here, okay? Um, there's a few other things. The little green blobs are called uh, single-stranded binding proteins. Now, the reason why we need them is because DNA is pretty sticky, right? We know that A wants to pair up with what letter? T. And C wants to pair up with G. So it's kind of, to me, kind of like, feel like they want to get glued together. So the role of these little green squares, and not really green squares, is to keep the DNA strand apart. Because if we don't keep them apart, we can't read them. So these these proteins are in that, look at the name single stranded binding proteins. What tells you what they do? What they do, right? These are proteins that bind to single strands of what of DNA to keep them open. Okay, keep them open. All right. So we talked about the big idea in uh, replication. The big idea is you take the old strand, you read it, and you use the old strand to build the new strand, right? You read the letter A, you put in the letter T. You read the letter C, you put in the letter G. Do you remember what this is? You left off looking at this picture. This is a picture inside the active site of which enzyme? DNA what? DNA polymerase, okay? DNA polymerase is the enzyme that actually builds, so here it's, it's labeled right here. This is the enzyme that actually builds new DNA by reading old DNA. So you can see that C stands for cytosine. So DNA polymerase is bringing in cytosine. That means it must have read this nucleotide. What would this nucleotide have to be then? This is the template strand. This is what's being read. So if it's bringing in cytosine, this must be what? What's the complement to cytosine? The G, guanine. It's guanine. Now I have a, an interesting question for you. You know we talked about enzymes, right? Do you remember what enzymes are? There are molecules that control a chemical reaction, and they're very specific. As you saw with glycolysis, right, each enzyme controls a specific step. It's not like one enzyme can do many, many things. So here's an interesting question. How does this enzyme, which is called DNA polymerase, control four reactions? Because if you think about it, this enzyme has to be able to carry out four different reactions. One reaction is it has to be able to read the letter A and bring in what base? T. It has to be able to bring in the base, read the letter T and bring in A. It has to be able to bring in C when reading G. And it has to be able to bring in G when reading C. That's four different reactions. How does one enzyme carry out four reactions, because you saw in glycolysis, each step is controlled by one enzyme, right? So four different reactions require four enzymes. Here, one enzyme, 
four reactions. How is that possible? How does that work? So how many of you can translate this in English? It is in English, but what do you think this means? This is the answer. How does one enzyme control or do four different reactions? It has to do with induced fit. You remember what induced fit is? When the substrate goes into the active site, what happens to the enzyme shape? It changes. So how does DNA polymerase carry out four reactions? So this is this is the big idea. When the, uh, the enzyme reads comes across the letter A and reads it, it changes shape in such a way that the best fit is for which letter to come in? T. And then when it reads, when it goes across and it reads the letter T, it changes shape again, so that the best fit is for an incoming A. And then when it comes across a G, it changes shape again, so that the best fit is for an incoming C. And then when it comes across a C, it changes shape again, so that the best fit is for an incoming G. So what's going on is that the enzyme changes shape. Every time it reads a letter, it changes shape in such a way that the incoming nucleotide is the complement of what it's reading. Okay? Now, we'll talk about this later. It's not perfect. There is a chance that it could make a mistake. There is a chance it could read an A and bring in a C. It's possible. Very unlikely, but it's possible. We'll talk about that uh, later on. Okay. All right. So let's talk about those two big problems or the two things that are curious. One is, why do we need the RNA? And you can see it right here. Uh, the RNA uh, is right here. So why do we need the RNA? And why are the strands being copied? Seems like in the opposite direction. So, do you remember the uh, DNA molecule as anti-parallel? So, do you know what that means? That means one strand goes one way, and the other strand goes the the other way. Now, do you recall what these are? No? Okay, so let's go back to the picture of a nucleotide. Let's go back to this picture over here, okay? So you see those numbers there, the 5 and the 3? So here's the 5, and here's the 3, and here's the 3, and here's the 5. So you notice that they're oriented in the opposite direction. So what's this? What's one of these? What do we call one of those? What's the name of one of those? It's got a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. What's that called? It's called a nucleotide okay right okay how many carbon atoms are in that nucleotide you remember what's the sugar that makes up that nucleotide is it glucose it's deoxy what ribose and then if you remember ribose has how many sugars in it not six it's a pentose five so the first one is here, the second one is here, the third one is here, fourth one is here, and the fifth one is over there. You'll notice the phosphate is attached to carbon number five, and the phosphate from the other nucleotide is attached to carbon number three. So the way it's oriented is that this is the five prime end, and the back of this part over here, that's the three prime end. So all the nucleotides are oriented the same way. So here's my, here's five prime, here's three prime, here's five, here's three. In other words, if you start with a five, you have to end with a, a three. 
The other strand is the same, it's just the opposite direction. So here's the five prime, here's five prime over here. That means this is three prime. So if we start with a five, this has to be what? This has to be ending with a three. Okay? Now you'll notice the nucleotide, if I put in a new nucleotide, where is it gonna fit? So look at this picture here, where's it gonna go? So this is the one prime carbon, two prime, three prime. Where is that new nucleotide going to go? It's going to go right here. So it's going to go to the three prime end. It's not going to go to the five prime end. It's going to go to the three prime end. Okay? That's the back end of the nucleotide. So far so good. So the way a nucleotide gets uh, attached is if you look at your ribose, Here's my ribose sugar, carbon atom one, two, three. All nucleotides get attached to the three prime end. So we're going to call that the back end, okay? Whereas the, the five prime end, where that phosphate is, we'll call that the front end. So this is the front, okay? And this is the back of the nucleotide. Okay, so far so good? All right. Now, You'll notice in this picture here that uh, the way this is being built is the opposite. You notice that this strand is being built this way, or we'll say to the right, and this strand over here is being built to the left. Okay? Now, if you think about it, one strand, so this strand over here, is three prime, that means that it has to end with five prime. And the other strand is what? The opposite, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So first off, let me ask you a question. If you were to look at the way this strand is being read, what do, where do we start? We start at the three prime end, and how do we read a DNA molecule? Start with the three prime end. Where do you think you're going to end up? So if you follow this strand, right? Follow it all the way around. Where do you end up? You end up over here. So the way DNA is read, it's read three prime to five prime. You understand that? Well, here's... Here's the thing. Which way is three prime to five prime on the other strand? Well, here's it right here. Here's the five prime end. Here's the three prime end. So that means that this, this strand starts over here and ends up over here. So this one's being read this way. So first off, you notice that the way the strands are read, they're read the opposite way. Okay? Now, which way is DNA built? Let's take a look at the picture. What do you start with? What's this? Five prime? And what's this? Three prime. So the reading is three to five, but the building is what? Five to three. Okay? We read three to five, but we build to three, which makes sense because these two, you see these two molecules, they're going to eventually be stuck together, and they have to be, as you saw, DNA is anti-parallel. Okay, so far so good? All right. Now, can I erase some of the stuff so it just, because otherwise it looks really Really messy, okay? You still raise this. So I'm gonna throw in a very simple rule. Then you're gonna understand why the, that animation had these strands being copied in a funny way. Uh, the enzyme DNA polymerase, and by the way, there's different versions of this. 
we're going to treat them as if it's only one, okay? So if you're, if you're in your textbook, you come across DNA polymerase 1, 3, and other types, just keep it simple. We're going to treat them as one, okay? DNA polymerase can only add, if you remember, in the previous slide, to the 3 prime end. It doesn't add to the 5 prime end. It adds to the back end of the nucleotide. Okay? So DNA polymerase can only add to the back end of the nucleotide. Are we okay with that little uh, simple rule? No? So it can't add, it can't add to the front end. Remember, this is the front. It can only add to the back end, the three prime end. Okay? But I'm going to explain to you why these are here. Why are these here? So if I have to ask you a really simple question. Uh, Iris, your job, I'm going to give you a painting. You have to hang it up. What would you look for? What would you ask me? Here's a painting where you hang it up. What would you ask me? Where do you want me to hang it? What would you look for? Where do you normally hang paintings? On a wall. You look for a wall. Okay? In other words, you have to look for to something to hang it on to, right? Well, DNA polymers has the exact same problem. It has to take a, a nucleotide like A and be able to hang it on to something. So it needs something to hang it on to. That's where the primers come in. So these primers are like the walls. We need them to start the process. So the primer has, if I draw them like this, it has a front end and it has a back end. It has a five prime end, it has a three prime end. What DNA polymerase needs is it needs to see the three prime end so that we could start building. Okay? That's why the primers are there. Because DNA polymerase needs to find that wall. It needs to find the back end of a nucleotide to be able to start building. It doesn't know how to build from scratch. It has to see something first. That's why the primers are put down by an enzyme called primase. It's in one of the lists. And then once the primers are built, then we can start the process of replication. Now, why is it built the opposite way? Why do you think it's built the opposite way? Because the strands are what? Anika? Anika? Sorry. Because the strand because the strands are anti-parallel. As you saw, we read uh, three to five, but we build five to three. But the problem is this strand is moving one way. This strand is moving the other way. So that means that one strand gets built one way, and the other one gets built in the opposite direction. Here's the problem, though. As the fork opens up, one strand could be built in the same direction as the fork. So which way is this fork opening? So if I take a look, uh, here's my fork. Is it opening left to right or right to left? It's opening left to right. So you can see here that uh, the fork is opening this way. Well, this strand, which is called the leading strand, is also being built that way. Because look at the orientation. Five to three. But what about the other strand? It's being built in the direction away from the fork. So what has to happen is, you build a strand first. Remember, the fork was smaller before. No, sorry, not the fork. But the opening was smaller, that bubble. And then as the bubble expanded and pushed out, then we can build the next fragment, which is what you saw in the animation. You build a little piece, you back up, you build another piece, you back up, you build another piece. The reason why this is happening is because this strand is being built opposite it relative to the direction of the fork. That's why it's being built in a peculiar, peculiar manner. Uh, manner, sorry. That's why it's being built in these what are called fragments. Okay. 
They're called Okazagi fragments, named after the scientists that uh, discovered them. You'll notice though, every time you start a new fragment, what do you see? What do you notice? Every time a new fragment is being built, what do you see? What are these? These are the primers. Okay. So one more time. Primers are there because the enzyme needs the back end, needs to see something to build off of. And two, uh, one of the strands is being built the opposite way, so you'll notice that it has to be done in pieces. Okay. Now, the primers. As you saw in the animation, what happens to them? So look, here are. Let's see, let's just back this up. So here we go. Here's that fork. There's that primer. Every time a new fragment gets put down, we have the primer because the enzyme has to see the back end. But you notice one strand is built, is built one way. The other strand is being built the other way. But every time a new fragment is laid down, we have a primer. And then what happens to the primers is they get removed. Okay. And you can see that here. So you saw right here there's a primer. See that primer right here? You'll notice it's gone. It's disappeared. Now, the explanation is quite easy here. So what's that simple rule with primate? Uh, sorry, what's that simple rule with polymerase? What does DNA polymerase need to see to build? What does it need to see? It needs to see what? Three prime end, right? Okay. So what happens if we take out this primer? What happens if we cut that primer out? Can we replace it? What's this? Three prime end. So DNA polymerase can go in and fill this gap in because what does it see over here? Three prime end. But here's an interesting problem. Look over here. If I take this piece out right over here, if this is the five prime end, what does this piece end with? This it ends here with the three prime end. What does this blue piece begin with then? Five prime end. Right? Now, we have an interesting problem. Because I just told you that DNA polymerase can only build off which end? The back end. What's this piece then over here? The blue starts with the five prime. That's the front end. So what happens over there? Okay. So here's my original DNA strand. Okay. We now know how replication works. We know that the two strands separate. We know that each strand is used to build the complement, the complementary base pairing. We know how it works. We know if we read if this is A, A, A. So here's A, A, A. Then this would be what? T, T, T. We know that it starts with primers because DNA polymerase needs to see the three prime end before it begins to build, right? And we know that the two strands are built the opposite direction, and that's why one of the strands is built in fragments. Okay. But something, and we say that we, I showed you that the primers can be removed, and if they get removed, we can fill them in, but there is a place where we can't fill them in. And this is an interesting problem. If we remove these primers, you'll notice what you're left with are five prime ends. 
And I told you that DNA polymerase needs to see what? Not a 5 prime end, but a sorry, but a 3 prime end. So it needs to see a 3 prime end, not a 5. Well, there's no 3 prime end here. So what happens? The answer is nothing. Nothing happens. These regions are called telomeres. They're, and you see they're stained over here. Now, this is only at the ends, okay? What happens is because the, they can't be replaced, guess what, guess what occurs every time the DNA gets copied? Look at this fragment now. What do you notice? Has it got longer or shorter? Shorter. Now, the reason why it's gotten shorter is because it, you notice that this part can't be replaced. Every time DNA gets copied, the ends get shorter because the three prime ends, sorry, because, yeah, the uh, primers, when they get removed, can't be filled in. These regions are called telomeres. So it says here that the DNA will shrink every time. And this shrinking is because of this fact right over here. Because the DNA polymerase cannot add to the 5 prime end. That means that there's only so many so much that the DNA can get copied. Because every time it copies, it shrinks. Um, now, there is an enzyme. And the enzyme that can replace it, that actually knows how to... Uh, to replace it, has a name called uh, telomerase. Okay. Telomerase builds the telomeres. The telomeres are these ends that get removed because of this problem. What's really interesting is that virtually all of your cells turn that enzyme off. They don't use it. So what happens is that a regular cell in your body, when it, like a stem cell that gets copied, eventually can only copy itself so many times, because every time it copies, it shrinks, it shrinks, it shrinks. And what happens is you can shrink a little bit of the DNA, but eventually what happens is that the DNA will shrink so much that the cells will just undergo uh, cell suicide, apoptosis, and they won't grow anymore. So every time the DNA gets copied, it shrinks, shrinks, and shrinks, until it gets that critical size, which it cannot continue, and take the program just shuts itself off. There is a type of cell in your body, however, it doesn't do this. The enzyme telomerase has been left on. Okay, it gets left on, which means that every time the DNA gets copied, the, it doesn't shrink. The gap gets filled in, okay, because this enzyme is being used. It's really interesting that this type of cell uses the enzyme and virtually all of your other cells don't. Want to guess what cell it is? Not a stem, well, it's not a stem cell. Not a stem cell. By the way, this is one of the reasons why you can't be immortal, right? Eh? Because every time a cell gets damaged and it has to be replaced through cell division, right? Every time a cell divides and copies its DNA, the DNA will shrink a little bit. So you can only copy the this, this cell so many times. If, if, you, if, you, if you want to be immortal, that, can, that has to be unlimited for you, right? You can't have your DNA shrink every time your cells divide. So that's one of the reasons why we can't be immortal, is because we don't use this enzyme. But there is a type of cell in your body we can consider to be immortal. That has never shrink, that doesn't shrink. Nope. What cell do you think it is? This type of cell uses telomerase, but a regular cell, like a liver cell, doesn't. What do you think it is? Think about this. Otherwise, in every generation, the DNA would shrink. Yes. Yeah. Sex cells. 
right? Sex cells cannot have their DNA straight. Because think about it. That means that your parents would have more DNA than you. Then your kids would have less DNA than you. Then your kids' kids' kids would have less DNA. Eventually, what would happen? We run out of DNA, right? Uh, actually, it would be, before we ran out of DNA, we, we, uh, we would have uh, bigger problems than that. But anyways, so yeah, in sex cells, um, the DNA doesn't shrink because that enzyme is left on. Okay. So a good question is, well, why don't why don't our cells just leave it on, right? What's wrong with having your DNA never shrink when it copies itself. It's an interesting question. I don't really know the answer to it. Um, some people th seem to think that the answer has is possibly because by leaving it on, you uh, you really increase the risk of cancer because it, uh, a lot of a lot of cancer cells will switch that enzyme on and become immortal. So it seems that maybe evolution has favored evolution has favored switching that enzyme off to prevent high really really high cancer rates. I don't really know what the answer is. Okay, but what I do know is that virtually all our cells switch that enzyme off, uh, except for uh, sex cells. Let me ask you a question. Um, the bacteria need this enzyme. So, do you know what the difference is between, there's a lot of differences, but one big difference between bacterial DNA and ours is, has to do with their shape. Yes, very good. So, uh, and I can also, the bacterial DNA is a circle, whereas ours is actually a line. Our DNA is literally, literally a line. You can stretch it out into a straight line. Although it's not a straight line, it's all coiled up. But it is got a beginning and it's got an end. So do you think uh, bacteria use telomerase? Do you think they have it? Do you think they need it? Where's the where are the telomeres? Where are they? So if you look at this picture. Where are telomeres? They're at the, they're at the end, right? And the problem is, it's the ends that shrink. So, do bacteria have telomeres? Why not, Jerusha? There's no end. So, do, does their DNA shrink? No, it doesn't. Okay? So that's, that's DNA replication. Alright? That's the basically, the simple idea, but also we talked about some of the more complicated stuff that goes on in uh, in replication. Next time we'll talk about um, how we go from, so this is basically from DNA to DNA, how we take DNA and we copy it into DNA. Next time we'll talk about how do we go from DNA to protein. And we'll talk about transcription and translation. Okay? We'll talk about, so we talk about replication and then we'll talk about transcription and translation uh, next time. That is the end.